After graduating from the University of Central Florida, she joined the Sisters of Life at a young age of just 22. She fell in love with the sisters in college by the community's work with pregnant women. She's an international speaker, and currently she serves as the vocations director for the Sisters of Life, one of my favorites. Please welcome Sister Bethany Madonna. What a gift to be with you this morning. What a joy. <laughs> you know, I remember when I first saw the Sistine Chapel. I was traveling to Rome solo before studying abroad. And finding a seat along the wall, I just looked up at those glorious frescoes of Michelangelo and saw the depiction of the story of creation. And I completely lost track of time. And every so often, the guards kind of yell over the chatter. So it's like, silencio, you know, and no photo. And so it, it, it's startling at first, but over the course of hours, it, it really becomes so fitting. You know, we need silence before the mystery to be able to receive the truth of the Holy Spirit. This is no photo. <laughs> this is an exposition of God's original design. God is the creator and lover of life. And there was a Genesis moment for you and for me when we were brought into being out of nothingness, formed in our mother's wombs, when he breathed his life into us. The breath of life always belongs to God. You know, in the 1980s, the Sistine Chapel was restored. Uh, over the centuries, the gorgeous paintings had been disfigured by candle smoke and incense and just pollution. There were literally layers covering over them, muting the colors and making everything seem dark and dim. It took a team painstakingly using the tiniest of instruments several years, and when complete, there was actually a question if they had painted over it. So brilliant were the colors and so bright the light. So this morning, I also desire to remove some of the layers to uncover the original splendor of woman, the gift of our bodies, our sexuality, and the joy of sharing in the life of unending love within the Trinity. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So the gift of creation, made in the image and likeness of God, our bodies Reveal our person. Male and female, he created them. God made every person sacred, unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable. The human person is a body-soul union. We don't, we don't have bodies, we are bodies. So it, it's not my arms that hug you, I hug you. <laughs> our bodies matter. They're not cages or shells to be freed from or manipulated. No, they, they have a meaning, a spousal meaning. We're made for a relationship. And think of woman's body. I mean, it's open to receive. There's an actual space within to welcome and nurture new life. She's able to nourish and comfort with her own body. I mean, this is incredible. I, I don't know about you, but this wasn't covered in my high school health class taught by the baseball coach. I mean, it was like, you know, here are the fallopian tubes, and you're like, no! Anyway, back to the garden. So after naming the animals, <laughs> Adam knew he was alone. It's not good for man to be alone. That is, until God made another person, woman. Adam realized he not only existed with someone, but for someone. Their very bodies spoke a language of reciprocal love. They were naked and felt no shame. No shame because they perceived the good of the other. There was no competition, no threat. Each was a gift that revealed the other as a gift. God's plan for the communion of persons was seen profoundly in the one flesh union of spouses. See, 
A man's body doesn't make sense by itself, nor does a woman's body. Now, a woman was formed from the rib of Adam, signifying that she was taken from his side. She's equal to him in dignity. Adam exclaims, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Such wonderment and ad admiration. And when I picture the scene, I just wonder if Eve, after like basking in this moment, like turned back to Adam and gave her own at last. You know, something like, at last, my love has come along. My lonely days are over. You know, it's true, only Edda James can really pull that song off. Anyway, um, let's pray. Let's just open our hearts right now. Father, Father, we ask you to grant us the grace, won by your son Jesus, to receive the gift of our lives anew. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we would experience your delight in us, the gift of being created in your image and likeness. Amen. You know, after creation, there was a fall, and then we were given the gift of redemption. You know, I remember when I was maybe four years old, uh, sneaking behind my mom's back, breaking something, and then getting caught, and she knelt and looked at me with eyes filled with hurt and said, did you deliberately disobey me? Now, I did not know what those words meant, but all I could think was, I sure hope not because that sounds like about the worst thing you could do to somebody that you love, okay? Disobey. The Lord bestowed all of creation on Adam and Eve in the dignity of freedom, setting a boundary as a good father, not wanting us to know the painful reality of evil or to have our innocence taken. The enemy preyed on Eve's innocence, tempting her, saying, did God say not to do that? Oh, <laughs> you won't die. No, no. You'll, you'll be like him, and he doesn't want that. Eve took the fruit, gave it to her husband, who was standing silently by, having failed to protect her, and both sinned. Their eyes were opened, and they knew they were naked and hid. There was a rupture of communion between the human person and God, between humanity and creation, between man and woman, even causing disharmony within our own bodies. God immediately promises a savior who is gonna strike that serpent's head. <laughs> In the fullness of time, God sent his son born of a woman. Woman is central to the event of salvation. The blessed mother, the new Eve, whose yes undid that no. In the gospel, we see Jesus, the new Adam, constantly restoring woman to the dignity she deserves. There was a conversation with the Pharisees that basically went like this. Hey, Moses let us divorce our wives for whatever reason. What do you say? And Jesus said, in the beginning, it wasn't so. In the beginning, you would never have wanted such a thing. Then he quotes Genesis verbatim. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. And what God has joined, let no man separate. What God has joined, let no man separate. The root of the word demonic is to divide, to separate. The enemy is always about trying to separate what God joined. And when God created the human person, what did he join? First, he joined body and soul. They are one and only separated at the moment of death and they'll be rejoined at the resurrection of the body. What else? God joined man and woman in marriage. The enemy wanted to separate us from God and he lied to the woman saying, God withholds. You have to grasp to possess rather than receive as gift. And to this day, the enemy still tempts woman to grasp, to grasp at love. We see this with pornography, you know, taking natural desires and twisting them, leaving women and men ravaged and ashamed. 
This is evident in sexual intimacy outside of marriage, which opens women up to be used and abandoned. This is also seen in contraception within marriage. Even the language of contraception is, is revealing. Contra means against, ception, new life, or birth control, or using protection. Likewise, acting out of same-sex attractions is a vulnerable place for women. See, women long to be received, and receptivity is a gift of the feminine heart. But grasping for sexual intimacy with another woman cannot satisfy. I took creative writing in college, and a classmate of mine shared her story with me. I'm going to call her Libby. Libby was with her serious girlfriend, Nicole, uh, when her phone rang, and Libby left the room to take it. It was her younger sister calling with the news that she and her boyfriend were newly pregnant, excited, but uh, very scared to tell the family. And Libby was soothing, encouraging. She said she'd be right over and hung up. Now, as Libby walked back, uh, she broke down, sobbing. And her girlfriend, Nicole, was confused, like, what's wrong? What happened? And Libby could hardly choke out the realization. And she said, no life can come from our love. As she recounted the story to me, it was clear that the Holy Spirit had revealed that truth to her feminine maternal heart at a time when she was ready to receive it. See, we only grasp for things that we perceive as good, but then we're shortchanged and we can't receive what God intended. Love isn't the only thing women are tempted to grasp at, but motherhood as well. For example, artificial forms of, of reproduction like in vitro. Now, every child conceived, regardless of circumstances, is good and beloved of God. But there are spiritual ramifications for contraception outside of a mother's womb through medical intervention. And there is then a loss of countless unborn lives who are either destroyed or frozen in time. Surrogacy also exploits motherhood by making it a commodity to be sold, treating woman's body as a mere container. Now, Jesus knows that we've been breathing the air of this culture, and he knows the lies that we've been told since we were very little. He makes a path in the wilderness. He gives us himself. He is the way, the truth, and the life that we long for. We receive everything from God, and we are not God. I do want to address the elephant in the room, or perhaps it would be more fitting to say the unicorn. Um, when a mythological cartoon animal is used to teach children about their sexuality, we've lost our way. I was talking to a woman in a master's program, and she was disturbed and shaken after one of her classes and wanted to talk it out. And she told me that one of her professors and his wife were LGBTQ activists and had decided to raise their two children both biological females, uh, gender neutral. So gender neutral names and clothes, etc. And he was sharing with the class that his five-year-old daughter, I'll call her Taylor, had come to him and asked, Dad, am I a boy or a girl? And he paused and answered, Taylor, what do you think? You get to choose. And she responded, I think I'm a girl. And he waited and said, you could be a girl, you could be a boy, you could be neither. And this little Taylor threw a fit of rage and shakes her fists and goes, no, dad, I am a girl. And she stomps out. And the professor looked at all of his class with tears in his eyes. And he said, what made Taylor think she was a girl? Society, society did this. My sisters, what made Taylor think she was a girl? You know, this is deeper than thinking. 
and feeling written into her DNA code at the moment of conception, present in every cell of her body. The pain and confusion of gender dysphoria causes real suffering, but it is unjust to intentionally create and inflict that confusion. Men and women who are experiencing the distress related to their body, to their sexuality, they deserve to be met with love, with compassion, and with pastoral care. Never denying or diminishing what is true to the dignity of the person, reverence due to the body, or the objective reality that body and mind are not separate or unrelated. Now, medical care may be necessary for those who are born with genetic or physical defects, but that stands in stark contrast to intentionally mutilating and sterilizing healthy bodies. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you might know what is God's will, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. You know, Andrew Comiskey founded Desert Stream Living Waters, which is a ministry based on Jesus' mercy and the dignity of men and women made in God's image. It equips Christians to gather in pursuit of radical wholeness. His own journey allows him to speak with clarity, sensitivity, and loving authority. He said this, we all make decisions with what to do with the pain in our hearts. Our sexuality is a window into that. It tells a story about our hearts, our ache, what should have happened and didn't, what did happen and never should have. In light of his love, the greater love, the more nearly we come to know him, the more we will see the kingdom come in profound ways. That's what sexual integration is all about. Jesus is always at work redeeming us so that we can live fruitful lives. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and when we allow him into the hurting places, the confused places, he comes with his grace. He forgives with healing mercy. Only the one who made us can heal us from self-hatred and anchor us in our dignity and goodness. And when, when a woman receives who she is, redeemed, then fear and shame are banished. Love is born and it bears fruit. So I'd like to speak to you about the gift of maternal love. Maternal love. One of our sisters was crossing a New York street when a gentleman not understanding consecrated chastity uh, felt the need to yell out, God said be fruitful and multiply. And she just, without skipping a beat, calls back, I'm trying. You know, we're all called to be fruitful in our love. Motherhood, whether spiritual or physical, is part of a woman's vocation to love. Every human person is entrusted to woman in a special way. Mother Teresa had heard that there was an orphanage of disabled children in war-torn Beirut that had been shelled and abandoned by the staff and wanted to bring them to her convent. The authorities argued with her desire to cross enemy lines Impossible. There would have to be a ceasefire. Against all odds, a ceasefire was called the next day. And you should see the footage of them going in to remove these 60 children. They're all smiles, happy to be held, received. Mother Teresa had set her gaze on the suffering one, and she gives us an image of woman and an example. As the daughter of a good father, revealing the love of her spouse. And with her mother's heart, she brings those little ones to safety out of a war zone. What's your war zone? Is there a war zone in your own heart? Because the Blessed Mother will come in. She'll bring you out, draw you to her son Jesus and his freedom. St. Edith Stein said, the nation doesn't simply need what we have. It needs what we are. A woman's soul is a refuge where other souls can unfold. God combats evil by the power of maternal love. 
Queen Esther is the model of this kind of power. Recognizing her dependence, she prayed and fasted so she could be an advocate for her people. Esther said, if I perish, I perish. Some things are worth dying for. Life and truth are worth dying for. The Son of God thought so. Do not be afraid. You were chosen at this unique moment in history to live and love with your feminine heart. I want to close by telling you about another mother who did just this. Raquel came to live with us at our convent and she said, sisters, I'm not having an abortion, but I would never tell another woman what to do with her body. We witnessed as God provided for her every need and as she embraced her maternity, her heart began to change. Raquel later told us this story. She said, I was in the hospital elevator on my way to a doctor's appointment. Another woman got on. I said hello and she burst out crying. I'm pregnant. And Raquel said, oh, congratulations, I'm pregnant too. This woman said it, she couldn't do it right now. It just wasn't the right time. And Raquel felt her baby move and she took this woman's hand and put it directly on her belly. And at that moment, her baby kicked. And this woman goes, wow. And Raquel goes, yeah, my baby's gonna be a linebacker. He's gonna be strong and he's gonna be blessed. And she said, why is he gonna be blessed? And Raquel said, cause he's here. Whether you cry or you laugh, if you're here, you're blessed. You're put here for a reason. She said, I'm gonna have an abortion. And Raquel said, no, you're not. You're gonna have a girl. And you dress her up in pink and you put ponytails in her hair and call her Raquel. And by the way, my middle name is Jasmine. And if she ever asks you how she got her name, you just tell her that you met a fabulous lady on the elevator one day who told you you were gonna have a beautiful little girl. They laughed, got off together, and Raquel walked her down to her OBGYN to make an appointment. We asked, did you keep in touch? And she said, no, I, I didn't see her again until two years later at the same hospital. She was pushing a stroller and ran up to me. She hugged me. She had twins, two girls, <laughs> and their names were Raquel and Jasmine. She had them all in pink, just like I told her. She said, Raquel, I love you. You don't understand, Raquel. I love you. I'll never forget your name, your face, your smile. <laughs> I would do anything for you. I love you. And Raquel said, I love you too. I understand. I've experienced it. You too were chosen for such a time as this. So give God permission.